Hi, Bull Bakers. We are shaking things up here a little bit at Need to Know. Instead of waiting for the Ask Gemma segment during the podcast, I'm going to be joining me at the top of every episode, and we are going to be talking baking trends, what's going on in the world, and answering your baking questions. This is a brand new format. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of conversation. You're not going to want to miss it. Just so you know, we're going to bring back our special guests really soon. But for right now, I hope you enjoy this new format and make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to Need to Know, where each week we serve up conversations about the hottest trends and takes on baking. I'm Mia Brabham, entertainment expert, host, peach cobbler lover, and all-around baking enthusiast. And I am here today with the professional chef, cookbook author, and host of Bigger Boulder Baking. If you know her, you love her. Here she is, Gemma Stafford. Hi, how are Hi, you? Hi, Mia. I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? Good. I'm doing great. I'm in yellow today. You know, it's a fun thing uh, for the show to just try to not repeat outfits, and I have to get creative every time, so... Today, you know, I just finally chose something new. It's no, great. nice color. I um, I tend to wear the same uh, tops over and over again. It's just yeah. out of pure laziness and nothing else. I've got a whole pile of clothes and I wear the same three tops. <laughs> That's the best. All you need is like the t-shirt. You just change it out, you know? Yeah. Minimalist closet. Um, but what's been going on with you lately? How is Bigger Boulder Baking doing? Bigger Boulder Baking is doing good. We're heading into our busy season, which is getting ready for summer. Um, we are doing our bulk shoot this weekend, which we do every roughly every quarter. And it, it is dependent. The, the recipes are determined by the season, by um, fan requests, but, you know, messages we get and um, queries we get our uh, social media team and, and the rest of the Bigger Boulder Baking team kind of chime in and they say like what what worked maybe last summer, what would be really fun, um, what would be a good seasonal recipe, um, what's really hot right now. Mm. And uh, we like replicate those recipes and we plan out our summer. Um, so I'm looking forward to it um, because we're doing a lot of ice creams this year. Last year, this time last year, we did a lot of pies, crumbles, crisps. We literally did everything under the sun, oh every fruit, every crisp topping you could possibly think of. And this year we are focusing on like gelatos and ice creams and a little bit more traditional custard based ones, which we Ooh. haven't really done before. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh my gosh. You know, I love a custard. Um, and it's just, it's cool to see, well, two things. It's really cool to see what we talk about sometimes in the podcast come to fruition on the site as far as recipes. So like we talked about, you know, lemons and how that's going to be big this spring in one episode. And now I see that you have all these lemon recipes, um, some of which I'm really excited to try. And another thing too, is that you just are so like the whole team and you, you're just so good with the fans and the listeners and you guys really listen to what people have to say. Um, and not a lot of brands can say that um, and not a lot of people can say that. And so I think it's just really cool um, that, you know, you take into account what people want you to make. I think that's so awesome. Yeah. So well, uh, they've been with us for this whole time. And yeah. uh, also there are customers, you know, like we asked them to show up and to, uh, you know, to uh, watch the videos, read the recipes, comment, you know, make recipes, share photos with us and all that sort of stuff. And then also like, you know, purchase my cookbook and things like that. So it's like, really important. Like we focus a lot of energy, almost everybody on the team in some way, shape or form is involved in responding back to uh, the fans. So yeah, it's a full-time job for multiple people, but uh, yeah. it's worth it. And it, it's, it does the job, you know, people love you in the comments. I love scrolling through the episodes. They're like, Gemma, we love her. I'm like, same. Um, but before we get into the episode today, I want to give a quick shout out to a podcast listener named, you're going to love this one, Gemma. Abigail loves baking cute. And she left a Aww. super nice review. I love, this is one of my favorite reviews. She says, I love it. This podcast is so good. I love hearing about Gemma and her nails too. I'm only 11, <laughs> but I really want to become a baker and this podcast encourages encourages me to do so. Oh, that's so sweet, Abigail. Oh, I love to hear that. <laughs> I know, Thank it's so you. nice. And she left you little emojis too. It's really cute. What um, kind of emojis? <laughs> she left uh, a little, the chef emoji with a, with a wooden spoon and then a yeah. smiley. So, Abigail, Aww. we love that's you. That's nice. Thanks for Thank leaving Thank you, Abigail. 
<laughs> yes, thank you. And if you know you're listening out there and you leave a five star review, we may read yours too on the show. So be sure to do that. All right, should we hop in, Gemma? Go for us. All righty, here is what I have for you this week, hot from the oven. So I know you're a huge fan of the show Friends, so I think you'll like this a lot. Courtney Cox posted a video on Instagram saying she's a total Monica because of her kitchen organization skills. Um, and she has a video, it's uh, an Instagram video, and she's like, tell me you're Monica without saying you're Monica. And her whole kitchen, she shows like her drawers have spots and the sh- there's like molded shapes for, you know, her bottle opener for like different types of uh, utensils. And then all, she has a whole drawer full of spices and every single one is labeled, like every single yeah. one. Um, and so Gemma, my question for you is, are you a Monica when it comes to kitchen organization? You know, I've been called a Monica um, <laughs> many times before, but I honestly think I'm probably more of a Phoebe, to be honest with you, mm. because I definitely have, I, you know, Monica is so detail oriented and um, likes everything to be a certain way. I am not like that. I can be quite airy fairy. And like yesterday I walked around the house looking for my computer and I went into the bedroom and my computer was on the bed. And I said to Kevin, have you seen my computer? And it was on the bed. And he said, it's right there. And I said, did you just put that there? Did you just put my computer on the bed? And he just stood there staring at me. And then I realized it wasn't my computer I was looking for. It was my phone. So halfway around the house looking for my phone, I forgot what I was looking for. And I thought it was my computer. So I I, I definitely am a little bit for the birds. Sometimes I get very distracted easily. So I really try and focus when I am working, when I'm like writing, when I'm doing recipes. Mm-hmm. I have to have kind of silence because I get so distracted so easily. But yeah, yeah no, I would say I'm definitely more vibing on Phoebe than I am Monica. <laughs> yeah, the the video is so funny. I'm like, how much time went into this? And then it just made me think, is it bad, Gemma? I don't know. I saw this video and I was just like, she did not do all that. Like, I mean, it was major organization. And I just wonder now, every time I see a celebrity with like a really organized kitchen, I'm like, did someone come in and do that for you? That's not a bad thing. But I want to know if someone, like, I want to know if it was like the home edit or something. But what do you think? It's it's those chicks that like, uh, that have a Netflix show that go in and uh, organize everybody's kitchen. Like they did Reese Witherspoon's. I think actually she produces Mm -hmm. their show. I have no idea what their name is or their Mm -hmm. their names are, but, um, for sure they get professionals in to do that. I, I just don't have, that's not something that, um, it's not something that I want to spend my time doing. I, I'm okay shoving stuff into a drawer. I have no issue with that. However, Kevin, on the other hand, wants um, like, you know, organization and he wants like, you know, and I do like things to have a home. I do, and you know, but um, I don't need everything to have its own little pocket and its own little label and its own little mm-hmm. whatever. So um, I'm probably, I have varying degrees of organization. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which Honestly, probably is much to Kevin's chagrin. I vibe with that because the job gets done either way. Like you bake a really great cake or you bake a really great tart. And it doesn't really matter how your kitchen looks as long as, you know, what comes out is really good. So um, it's funny. I'm not going to lie. When I was watching the video, I paused it because, like I said, her drawers were so organized and she had this insane, insane labeling system. Um, she had three different types of salt. She had like truffle salt, smoked sea salt, oh. sea salt barbecue, all these variations. And I wanted to know, have you tried any of those? And also, do you use different types of salt for baking? Um, so I've tried truffle salt. I had a jar here that, um, my photographer gave me in a Christmas box, which, uh, was super yummy and it did taste like, did I say, sorry, did I say black garlic? It's black garlic salt. Ooh. So, um, I had that, that was super yummy and I could taste it. I did also have a jar of smoked salt that I got on a trip to Maine one time. 
Ooh. And um, that didn't taste like anything. It didn't taste, it tastes like salt, but it did, there was no smokiness and whatever. So I tend not to buy those because I feel like mm. they don't, you know, they're $10 and they don't ever taste like what they say they're going to taste like. Mm. The um, What I do, there's some dude outside playing golf on my street. <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> He just on has the street, golf, we do it anywhere now. He's practicing his swing. I don't know, some <laughs> random guy just pulled up and started practicing his swing. Oh anyway, um, the that I do for certain recipes in baking, I've started to use coarse sea salt Ooh. because you still get loving, you get saltiness, but you still get little bites of salt also. So when it comes to certain things like brownies, uh, cookies, things like that, I, I use coarse sea salt because mm. it doesn't always dissolve all the way and you get little lumps of it and I find that that works really well in certain recipes when it comes mm. to cakes and things like that I uh, just use regular tables table salt nice okay yeah because I've seen people have really strong opinions about salt they're like if you don't have five different types of salts in your cabinets you're doing baking wrong and I'm like I just like coarse sea salt. Like that's what I use. Um, so yeah, I was wondering about salts. I didn't know they were such a big deal, but I yeah. feel better talking to you about this, knowing that my coarse sea salt is absolutely fine. Totally It's totally cool. fine. And um, you often, and then also like, it's a little bit more expensive. So also often it's not necessary. Um, I, I should look, I, I actually, it's funny, um, salt, since I started baking more with sea salt, I said to myself, I need to sit down one night and read, learn more about salt because there's like, there's different, there is, um, there's different variations and they're not all swaps one for one. And mm -hmm. then also a lot of people just bake with kosher salt. Mm. And uh, so I really need to educate myself a little bit more. And I just haven't done that yet. But you just inspired me to do so. So next time I can talk yes. more in depth about salt. We're adding a new segment. It's going to be... <laughs> basically our homework study session yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and book club. We'll come together next week. Everyone bring a <laughs> lesson. It's fine. Um, okay. So speaking of this whole thing, got me thinking about spring cleaning. And so I wanted to talk to you about this because I'm sure there's people who are, you know, cleaning their whole homes right now, including their kitchen. And they're probably wondering like, okay, it's been a few years that I've had this bakeware. I've had it too long. I should probably throw it out. Um, maybe it's rusting or it's just not the same anymore. So I wanted to kind of have a conversation about um, when to know when it's time to part ways with your pans? Like, what are the signs? Rust is a good sign. Mm -hmm. um, rust is a big no-no. They, um, I don't know if you can hear this, but I have a cold, so it's just taking me a little bit longer today to talk. Um, <laughs> okay. But rust is a big no-no. Um, uh, I would say um, get rid of anything that is rusty. Um, I've hung on to stuff that's rusty and it, like because it, it photographs really well or it's a certain size or a certain shape that I can't get anymore. Um, if you take good care of your your um, baking sheets and pans and things like that, I've got a whole um, post on it on biggerbolderbaking.com about how you can care for your pots and your pans and stuff like that. Um, they should last a long time by good quality. I would say one thing that I, I often tell people to do, and this has always worked well for me, when it comes to baking pans, don't, don't buy uh, the really cheap stuff, like pay a little bit more but what I do, my secret is I go to TJ Maxx, I go to Marshall's or I go to Ross. Mm -hmm. You can get really good quality pots, pans, and mm. um, baking sheets, cake pans, all those sorts of things there. And they're much, they're really discounted. And there's absolutely yes. like they're, they're obviously perfect in great condition. But um, you could buy all clad pots and pans. You can get like Le Creuset pots and pans, like very expensive pans for like a deeply discounted price. So I would say definitely if you're in the market for buying stuff, um, go there because it really does make a big, big difference. Oh my gosh. And then they, they, just take care of them. Nice. And they say that when you spend more time with a person, you kind of start becoming like them. And I swear we're on the same, wave same wavelength most of the time because that was literally going to be my next question. Like, can you get them from Marshalls? Is that good quality? Can you go to TJ oh, Maxx? Yeah. So 
Good to know. Um, that might Absolutely. be my next stop when I get, when I move and I get new pots and pans and all that good stuff. But yeah. Donate whatever you have. Uh, some stuff, rusty stuff, don't donate it. Put it in the bin. Okay. Um, but unless it's, it's like, um, just, I want to clarify that if you get a rusty uh, cast iron, you can actually salvage that. You can bring it back to life. So, um, you know, How? do a little bit of, well, there's, you have to season the pan again. And I'm mm-hmm. not an expert. I'm not an expert in it. I know that uh, Kevin has bought one or two of our pans back to life again after they got rusty. Hey, Kevin. So, um, <laughs> they're, so they're not, it's not always, when it comes to cast iron, you usually can bring that back to life. And that'd be good mm-hmm. because it's quite expensive as well. You don't want to throw those away. Yeah. Okay. And just to clarify, I think I know the answer, but I know someone out there is listening and is thinking of this question. It's my job to ask it for them. So... Even if it's rusting, if it's not good quality, parchment paper is not an excuse, right? Like just because you line it does not mean it's okay. You should probably, it's still time to throw it out, right? Throw it out. Okay. Yeah. Invest in some new stuff. And um, just saying that, Mia... um, I've started doing, I know we spoke about this already, but I've started doing Amazon lives every week. Yes. And during the lives, I, uh, it's, it's a, com- it's a great combination of baking and of shopping. So, mm. um, through the live, I, I go through a recipe, but I also go through all the tools and all the equipment that I need to make that recipe. And often we cover, um, baking pans in it. I have during the live, it's really great because I can do a carousel at the bottom of all the equipment that I'm using. So people can <laughs> click on it, read the reviews, uh, you know, just see, um, like, you know, price and if it's something that they would need. And it just, it makes, it just, it allows me to answer that question that I get asked so many times, which is yeah. what pans do you use? What, uh, you know, what grater do I need? Do what, do I need super expensive knives? I tell you everything mm. that I use and it's just a really great way to um, educate yourselves on like, okay, maybe I need to like, I need to buy um, a a step up when it comes to the knives. You know, I, um, mm. last week I used a microplane. Have you got a microplane, Mia? No. Oh my gosh. So um, Rachel on our team in Hawaii watched our live and she said, I just got a microplane and I can't believe Rachel cooks and bakes so much. I can't believe she did not own a microplane before this. It yeah. is an incredible, so it's a zester. So you think it's only for lemon and lime and oh grapefruit and stuff like that, but it's not. I, u- I use it for everything. It is a blade that never goes dull. It's less than $20 online. I think it what? has like on Amazon, it has like, I think 16,000, like almost five star reviews. It That's never amazing. goes dull. I've had mine for 10 plus years oh my gosh. and I use it pretty much every day for chocolate, ginger. I grate garlic. Um, I do. It just, it's great for hard cheese, which I do all the time when I make pasta. Uh, I, I, I'm always using it. So little things like that, those wow. like little, um, like fab finds that I like to call them that I, I shout out every week in my Amazon live, those like 20, under $20, amazing kitchen tool that I can't live without. So that's another good reason to tune into the lives because I also give like those little tidbits. Yes. So anyway, I segued into my Amazon lives from your baking pans, but that <laughs> it does kind of connect. It does because I was going to ask you actually, if you had like little known nifty kitchen finds or bakery that you really, really love to recommend to people. So you kind of answered it. And now people know they can just watch your Amazon lives if they want to know anymore. So yeah. Amazing. Every week, <laughs> every week I cover a new tool and I like, you know, it is, I don't like to have anything in excess in my mm-hmm. house. My kitchen is so tiny. I don't know if you can see Mia. I know you haven't been here, but like, it's super tiny. So I can't have multiples of things. I need to have one thing and for Mm. it to be like good quality. So I don't have to have five more of them. So, but I do, there are like a Danish dough hook that um, I'm going to cover today um, in Ah. my Amazon live, things like that, that I've never, that I don't uh, get time to shout out and talk about on YouTube, but yeah. on Amazon, I do a live for like almost an hour, at least once a week. And we go through all that stuff. So it's fun. It's chatty. Um, it's still baking and shopping at the same time. 
Oh my gosh. Amazing. Everybody check it out. I'm really excited. I still, I've been so busy. I need to watch still. So I want to watch this one because the Danish dough hook sounds really. Yeah. Something you can I've comment. never heard of. You can comment mm. uh, live. So you tune in live, you comment at the same time. And, um, you know, any questions you have, Mia, just like, you know, let me know. Oh my gosh. I'll be the one in the comments like, help, help. <laughs> Here's my five questions. Um, but before <laughs> we move on to the next news, baking news of the week, um, is there anyone's kitchen that you'd really like to see into? I know you're like, I don't really care if it's organized or not, but is there just a chef or a baker who you love who you're like, I want to see how their kitchen looks? Oh, geez. You know, that makes me think of two things. Um, it makes me think of like, I want to look into, I would want to look into somebody's kitchen because I'd want to nosy around to see like, if they like what kind of cereal they eat or do they eat cereal or like, Ooh. you know, what kind of snacks do they have? Do they are like, are they goldfish people or do they like snack on healthy <laughs> nuts or something? Like those are the kind of things that I would want to be more like nosy than yeah. like, wow, these guys have all their flour like labeled and like, <laughs> um, you know, in alphabetical order, it would just be out of pure nosiness. But it also makes me think that what if somebody rooted around my kitchen and saw the like how I'm like organized and I use air quotes. I know people listening can't see me, but like, you know, I there like we have very little space here in Santa Monica. So like yeah. my my pantry is three presses and it is chock a block full of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um I have so much uh, plates, platters, serving dishes for bigger, bolder baking and for our photo shoots. And uh, those take up a huge amount of the cupboards. And I would, I'm just wondering, like if somebody opened up, like often here, it's funny because I love my food. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of my day is spent thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner. But sometimes yes. there's like Same. literally barely anything in my cupboards or in my fridge. Mm. I like to have somewhat of an empty fridge and mm. um like I don't like to have stuff hanging around so I go through like I like to have often you'd open my fridge and there's like there's nothing that looks like could be for dinner in there <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's so funny you say that because I've been staying with my parents for a little bit and their fridge is so full like so full of food always and it stresses me out because like in my kitchen I go grocery shopping for the week. I have the exact ingredients I need for all my recipes. And it's so pleasing to me at the end of the week to see it emptied and be like, okay, time to start over. Um, but it's just, yeah, you're right. That's too. very interesting to see what, yeah, it's way more interesting to see what people have in their cupboards and in their kitchen. I'm just nosy. Their organization. <laughs> Give this girl a Netflix show. You need a Netflix show <laughs> called like Snooping with Gemma. I'm waiting. Um, okay. Um, so next no, up. Mia, I didn't answer your hmm. question though. Oh, okay. Tell me. Um, I didn't even realize. So <laughs> the, who would I like to snoop around their kitchen? Yes. <laughs> In all honesty, you know, I, I think of like maybe somebody like Kristen Wiig or somebody like, you know, does <gasps> she cook? Like, I don't know if she cooks or yes. not. Like, what does she have for breakfast? What does she snack on? Like, like I always, I wonder because, you know, these people travel, like actors and actresses travel so much. Like, mm -hmm. do they have like stocked fridges and pantries and like, you know, food for dinner in there? Is it all takeaway containers? So mm -hmm. yeah, I think I would just like to look around like a celebrities. Oh, you know who would be a really good one? Is who? it Jillian Michaels or Jillian Michael? The oh my fitness. gosh. She probably yeah. has like three just really healthy ingredients. She probably eats the same thing for like breakfast, lunch, dinner, no, dessert. No, like, I, I guarantee you if you went snooping around there, she probably has like a Costco size box <laughs> of like gummy bears or something. Like you just, you, honestly, you think oh, they must be super healthy and they don't eat junk food. And then you find a whole pile of Milky Ways underneath the couch. <laughs> and you're like, hold on a second now, Jillian. <laughs> Good to know you'd be checking under the couch. Oh my gosh. Uh, that's oh, yeah. hilarious. <laughs> okay. So moving on to our next topic, Gemma, have you ever seen The Sixth Sense before? Yeah. Years ago though, years and years ago when it came out. 
So I'm starting to think that clearly it's not real. The real sixth sense is cake whispering. I think it's a talent. It's amazing. And so the takeout.com actually uh, published an article asking a burning question. And they asked, do cakes sing when they're done? Um, and so the writer Dan Jake says that even in such a precision, precision driven practice like baking, there's still wiggle room within recipes, especially with timing. And so I want to know, is this true that cakes sing when they're done? And what does a singing cake even sound like? I think you'll have to tell me. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> um, do they sing when they're done? They do make a little noise. Like they do kind of like make a little, not, not poppy noise, but like they, you can hear them when they come out of the oven. I don't... <gasps> I have to say, no, you're going to have to educate me a little bit more on singing cakes because as many cakes as I've made over my lifetime as a professional pastry chef, I've never noticed them singing. I would say, does bread sing? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Because you take bread out of the oven and it still crackles. Like if you put it up to your ear, you can hear it crackling. And then, of course, you get to kind of crunch <sighs> the crust and crack it and you hear that lovely Ooh. sound. Oh my um, gosh. So I would say bread sings. Absolutely. But uh, cakes, I don't know about that now, Mia, to be honest with you. I think that <laughs> might be a bit, uh, a bit far-fetched. <laughs> yeah. I got, I honestly got excited when you started answering this. I thought you were going to start singing. You were like, it kind of sounds like, and I was like, yes, do it. But I'm not oh, that no. mean. I won't make no, you no, make no. the sound. Um, but so I was reading through the article and it was really interesting. And they interviewed Peter uh, Sawkins, I think, from British Bake Off. And he said that he knows a cake is underbaked if he hears it boiling because it's like there's so much more baking to do if he hears it too much. But he's like, I just want, you know, to hear a gentle simmer or a sound and then, you know, um, but no sound me that it's like if there's no noise, it's overbaked for sure, which I thought was interesting. So I uh, sorry, me. <laughs> <laughs> I you're like, I don't I, know what this is. I never in I've never Never heard. Of, I've never heard a cake boiling. I've never heard a cake simmering. Um, I, I must. I, I'll, I'll read his article and and find out a little bit more. But uh, that's this is news to me. That's so funny. And the whole time I was thinking this, I was like, but like, isn't it bad to open the oven? So I'm like, how do you even hear it? I'm like, how are these people hearing this? Yeah, you putting your ear up to it or are you opening it? But I know that's bad to do. So I'm like, I don't know. So I guess the answer here is cakes don't really sing. When they're done baking. <laughs> um, I think maybe let, I, I would, so if, um, you know, I'm, may, you know, I'd say let everybody be the judge, you know, like maybe next time you bake mm. a cake, like have a little listen when it comes out of the oven and see if it's yeah. making noise. Maybe there's something I'm missing, you know, but uh, so far to date, I've, I've never heard a cake sing. Oh my gosh. I sing yes. when I eat cake, if that's a different thing. <laughs> I do I a happy dance. dance and I sing. Yeah. Yes. The happy food dance. Oh my gosh. It's my favorite thing. It's just uh, a guttural reaction at this point. I can't control it. Um, but yeah, every, that's a great idea, Gemma. I think if you're listening, you should totally let us know um, next time you bake something, what you hear, we can just kind of crowdsource it. Maybe get like an ASMR expert on one episode, yeah. purely ASMR. And we just have someone just sounds. reading everyone's answers, all the sounds. Um, but do you have, before we move on, do you have any unconventional ways of figuring out this when you're baking or you just like I set a timer that's it <laughs> no not on a conventional way it's all for me it's all about sight so that's why in the videos I always want to show you a stage of uh, a dough being ready a pastry uh, coming together um, you know, do, your, your mug cake coming out of the microwave, your brownies coming out of the oven. It's all about sight. And I just make sure mm. that Zach, our cameraman, gets up close and personal so you can see that. Because nice. for me, it's... Um, it's touch and it's sight. I, I can touch a brownie mm. in the middle and I can feel that it's still soft under my finger, knowing <sighs> that once it goes cold, it'll still be fudgy in the middle. I know <gasps> like by touching a cake, it's firm under my finger that it's done. Like I, I, I've, I've been doing this a long time. So I, I know just by looking at most things that th they're ready. How far into your career in baking did you kind of develop that? That ability that to touch ears. I think mm. honestly, since so, um, I'd say a few years as I've gotten older, and since bigger, bolder baking, because we have millions of fans around the world, th those details for me to catalog 
uh, those details is super, super important because I need to relay those in my recipes because um, not everybody, everybody's at different levels and you need to give them as much information as you can to get the recipe right. So I've become, and this kind of goes back to uh, I'm not a Monica, but I, in some respects I am. I've become very detail oriented and uh, when it comes to precision in baking, mm. timing, looks, telltale signs, uh, what you're going for, the amount of liquid, too much liquid. Precision is really, really important in baking. And I have doubled down on that ever since uh, doing bigger, bolder baking. And I always try to cover that in all of my videos just to make sure that, you know, uh, somebody in Malaysia gets the exact same. And, you know, even though it's, it can be humid there and, you know, yeah. the app, the air can be different that they get the same results as I do here in Santa Monica. That's amazing. And so you talk about precision. I want to talk about something that's not precise in any way, shape or form. There is a new TikTok trend, Gemma, and it's called honeycomb pasta. It oh is gosh. absolutely wild. It's essentially a pasta pie and it looks like a giant honeycomb. And so um, a TikTok user stacked rigatoni in a spring form pan. Yeah, I sent you the video so you can look at it. Oh, and did you? Yes, Gemma. Oh my gosh. It is. It's, it's insane. She's stands up. Uh, the rigatoni in a spring form, spring form pan stuffs each one with string cheese, smothers it in pasta sauce, and then puts like ground beef and shredded cheese on top and she bakes it. And I just want to know <laughs> what are your initial thoughts on this? And does the string cheese make you cringe as much as I did? I was like, what is going on? And one commenter while you're finishing watching said, my Italian grandmother is just absolutely spinning in her grave. And I thought that was so funny because I mean, it's just, it's creative. I'll give it that, but it's what is going oh, on. <laughs> that is so many types are wrong. Like <laughs> so many. Um, no, absolutely no. So first off, the rigatoni, I've seen dishes like that before where, where they are um, all facing up. Yeah. String, string mozzarella is literally the lowest on the food chain when it comes mm. to cheeses. Yeah. And or cheese, uh, especially mozzarella. Um, she puts over a jar of tomato sauce. And what's funny is the meat isn't even cooked in the tomato sauce. Like she didn't make a bolognese. The meat yeah. goes on separately. But then at the very end, she dumps, and for want of a better word, she dumps a bag <laughs> of shredded mozzarella on top of it. And I know that brand that she uses and that's not mm -hmm. good mozzarella. <laughs> uh -huh. um, no, absolutely. All kinds of no, no, no. All People kinds should of not no. be taking inspiration from that. Ugh. We've no. talked about it before, but I think we both said Sargento is like really good cheese. That's a good cheese to use. Um, I haven't, I, I don't know Sargento. I haven't used that. Oh, okay. That that must have been something else. I'm like, why are you talking about this? I'm clearly talking about Sargento all the time. Um, I love that cheese. I use it for my mac and cheese. But yeah, this this video, I, for me, it's just the string cheese factor, but it does look good if it just wasn't string cheese. Like that's what gets me. It's just, it's just yeah, all types of no, wrong. It's, that's <laughs> not, yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want to encourage this kind of behavior. So I'm just going to say a hard no to that. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. Speaking of encouraging behavior, let's answer fan questions this week. And I'm really excited for these. They're a lot about um, ingredients. So the first question is from Teresa Rose Vinod 18. And they asked, what is the difference between baking soda and baking powder? So starting with some of the basics. Oh gosh. Um, so baking powder and baking soda, they're two, they're both raising agents. They're both, they're both leaveners. One of them Baking soda is an alkaline. Sorry, I'm, you can hear my uh, my my cold in my nose. Um, one of them is, a, is an alkaline. Baking powder. The 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 difference between them is baking powder is activated with liquid. So mm. you make a cake and you add milk to it, um, and that 
once those combine and hit, that will activate your cake and it will help it rise. Mm. Baking soda, another leveling age, a leavening agent is activated by an acid because it's alkaline. So you have to, you don't just, you can't just use milk to mm-hmm. activate that. With baking soda, it is activated by something acidic. So yogurt, sour cream, Buttermilk is very common. Ooh. Some lemon, lemon juice in milk, uh, something like that, like a substitute for buttermilk. But that's how the both of those activate, and they so they 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 have they the both are leaveners, but they do mm. serve different purposes. If you notice with some of my cookie doughs, they they have no baking powder, but they do have baking soda and those cookies tend to be kind of flat, gooey in the mm-hmm. middle and crinkly. If mm. you add baking powder to cookie dough, what you get is kind of like a cakey cookie dough, which is the opposite mm. effect of the baking soda. So you get a thick cakey kind of cookie, which is like some people love that. Um, so they do serve different purposes. They cannot be interchanged. If that was your next question, Mia, you can't <laughs> just see um, baking soda in a recipe and say, I don't have any, I'm going to use baking powder. Not the same thing. It's very important to follow a recipe as written. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yes. Good to know. And it's so funny you bring up cakey cookies because we have talked about this on the show before. And I saw a TikTok where someone put a cakey cookie in a waffle maker and it was just insane. I was like, why would you do that? That just seems the internet is crazy as we know. Um, Mia, stay off TikTok. (laughs) That's crazy. Gemma does not encourage this behavior. I know. I'm like, I do need to stay off. They're teaching me bad, bad things. Um, Okay, but next, really quickly, we have a second to answer this. Uh, Simi Elena asked, I recently started milking my own flour at home. I'm learning my recipes don't behave the same way with flour that's not bleached and enriched. So do you have any tips? Um, That's funny. So I I do have... um, I, d- I use unbleached and and um, not enriched flour also. Mm. And I don't personally find that um, there is a difference. However, I'm using store-bought uh, flour. You're milling your own flour, which is like major props because that's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's, it's not the unbleached and the, uh, the, um, the fact that it's not enriched. It's the fact that you're milling it yourself. So um, I would say... So I, I know zero about milling flour. So I'm not the, the expert to guide you on that. I would say that um, maybe just research it a little bit more. Are you getting like a really fine grind on your flour? I'd say that's really important. Mm. But um, with if you are using store-bought that's not bleached, um, which I, I recommend that you do do that, and not enriched, um, it should be one for one, like easy peasy uh, swap out. Nice. Good to know. And props to Simi again for milling her own freaking flour. Yeah, major That's props. Cool. You're doing more than a lot of us are doing. So congratulations <laughs> to you. Um, you deserve all the best. Uh, and so I think that does it for this week. I mean, I feel like I could talk to you forever and for hours as always, but Bold Baking listeners, if you love this new format, let us know how you feel. Reach out to us at Bigger Boulder Baking Everywhere. And don't forget, we're just starting out. So be sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars where you listen. We might even read it on the show and leave a comment with what you want to see next week and let us know. We asked a question earlier too, um, to let us know what you think. So answer that as well. Um, I'm Mia Brabham again, and you can find me on Instagram at yours truly Mia or Twitter at hot mess Mia. Gemma, where can we find you? You can find me at Gemma underscore Stafford on Instagram, Gemma Stafford on Facebook, and then always bigger, bolder baking on all platforms. Yay. Perfect. Amazing. Beautiful. Bold as always. And I will see you next week. Bye, Gemma. Bye, Mia. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.